Hello, everyone. Welcome to Robotics Today. The first talk last week was a great success with uh, over 2,000 attendees and a very lovely uh, discussion. Today, we're very fortunate to have uh, Leslie Kevlin as our speaker. Leslie is a professor at MIT of uh, Computer Science and uh, Engineering, and she has made uh, several fundamental contributions to the field of decision making under uncertainty and uh, reinforcement learning. And more broadly, she has significantly advanced the field of intelligence, intelligent and autonomous robotics. Uh, today, she's going to share with us uh, her views about uh, robot learning and decision making for robotics. The format is going to be the same as last time. We're going to have a talk of about 40, 45 minutes, which will be followed by a panel discussion, and then we'll open up uh, the discussion to questions from the audience that is going that are going to be moderated by the student panel uh, formed by Ansalu, James, Benoit, and Rachel. Then, without further ado, I'd like to leave the stage to Leslie. All right, thank you very much for inviting me to the seminar and for the nice introduction. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, how to get robots to do, to learn to do complicated things in complicated worlds. So my overall goal here is to understand AI and to do it in the context of robotics. So I really wanna make some kind of a general purpose intelligent robot and use that as a way to study intelligence in general. So. For me, the aspects of intelligent robotics that maybe are not under as much consideration as they should be is handling really high variability. So I'm interested in high variability in domains. Uh, one example that I uh, like to bore my students with is trying to make a robot that could make tea in anybody's house. Imagine a robot that could go to absolutely anybody's house in the whole world, figure out how to make water hot, figure out what kind of leaves they like to put in the hot water and how to do that. So that's a nice general purpose problem that I don't think we have even the beginnings of an idea really of how to do or to do any task in your house. So if we wanted to make really general robots or even specific robots, we have to take a position about the process by which we're going to engineer the robots. So I'm gonna take the viewpoint here of a robot engineer, I'm going to assume that we, as the robot engineers, we're going to make a robot factory. And our robot factory for right now, I'm so I'm a software person, so I'm going to assume that the hardware is fixed. And my job is to figure out what software to put in the robot. So I imagine that this robot uh, is going to be able to make observations and take actions in the world. And ultimately, Really, almost no matter what, we can see the program that we put in our robot's head as a mapping from sequences, histories of observations and actions to the next action. So that's not really making much of a commitment at all. It's just a pretty generic way to see the problem of, of behaving in a world. So what program should we put in the head of our robot? So here's a way to think about that. I would like to say that when you come to my robot factory and you order some robots, you tell me a distribution over the domains that those robots might find themselves in. So if you are a, a car factory and you need a robot to weld a particular model of a car, then you'd give me a distribution over domains that's very, very specific. It would say, oh, you just, you're gonna be in a world that's like this and you have to achieve this. But if you want the robot to make tea in anybody's house, then the distribution over domains is very high variance. And when you come to me and order the robots, I now have a problem of figuring out the program that would optimize this criterion. So I wrote down a formula. It's, we don't have to commit to the details of additive reward, but fundamentally the idea that we wanna find one program that works well in expectation over the distribution of worlds that this robot might find itself in. That's the idea that I think is important. And the reason that I'm 
particularly attached to this idea is that if we could understand a distribution over domains and specifications of, of what the robot's supposed to do, then we wouldn't really need to fight about whether it should be neural or symbolic and whether it should learn or not or whatever, that for that problem, for that distribution of problems, there really is in some sense an optimal strategy. So that's a good thing. I think we don't have to fight about that. But even though that optimal strategy might exist, it's a hard, hard job for us, the engineers, to actually find it. So given a specification, if you could get the specification, how would you find the pie? That's a hard problem. So really, that's what I mostly want to think and talk about, which is how is it that we, we as engineers, can come up with good policies to put in the head of the robot? Okay, so one way to get a handle on this problem is to think about the space of distributions over domains, right? So they, these distributions might vary in character and depending on that distribution, we might have very different kind of solutions for the problem of what, what program to put in the robot's head and then how to find it. So one axis of variability is just like, how complicated is the problem? How complicated is the policy that we're gonna need? So maybe solving one particular problem in one particular domain is not, not so hard, but maybe all of, all of T is difficult. Another dimension is how much uncertainty we, the factory, have about the problem the robot's gonna have to solve. Right? So these are at least two axes of variability of this specification. So we might say, oh, we have a narrow task that we know in advance or a, a complicated set of problems, but still we know in advance what they're gonna be. Maybe we don't know in advance what's happening and maybe really it's complicated and we don't know. Okay, so how can we think about making a policy? So what we've learned, I think, over the history of engineering, and it hasn't changed, is that fundamentally the way we tend to approach these problems is we pick some class of models and some way of acquiring the models, and we have to minimize engineering cost. So what is engineering cost? Well, there's human engineering cost. There's like how hard it is to write the models down, how hard it is to make a simulator, how to do reward shaping, all these things. There's work human engineers have to do. And there's work that machines have to do, right? So maybe they have to do optimization, learning, parameter tuning. And fundamentally, I think the way we should think about this is that we want to pick a model class where humans have useful insight, uh, where the optimization part is not too hard, and where whatever kind of learning we need to do will generalize well. Okay, so what we need to do then is come up with a policy. And so let's think about first kind of forms model classes for policies for robots, and then we'll think about how to find them. So what are the forms that a policy might take? Well, the simple form of a policy is policy. Okay, so we could say, hmm, all right, we're just gonna think of our problem as a policy, and, and that's the only architectural structure we're gonna put on it. We just have to find the good policy. Uh, but trying to find searching directly in policy space is actually pretty hard, right? So as engineers, if our problem is to just produce that policy directly, that turns out to be kind of a hard search space. So maybe we can think differently. Maybe it's easier to come up with some kind of a value function. Maybe that's easier to represent than the policy. And then that value function, we just have to build in a little piece of an algorithm, which is argmax, roughly, and we can make a policy out of a value function. Um, the reason we like value functions is because dynamic programming gives us a really great handle on how to compute them. There are lots of problems, though, where the dynamic programming principle doesn't actually help too much. And so this isn't, I think, the best way to do all kinds of policy representation. Another strategy, which uh, uh, you might call model predictive control, would be to put a planner actually inside. So now we have even more algorithmic commitment. We might say, we're going to put a planning algorithm inside the robot's head, right? This big blue box is still the policy, right? It's still the policy that's in the robot's head. But we're going to put a planner in there. Uh, and then how we're going to represent the domain is by representing some kind of a transition model and a reward function. Uh, those are the models and the planner algorithmically will figure out what's going on. And then what we have to do is put those models in there. Okay, that's a way. Um, 
it might be hard to do this at some very raw level, right? If the actions have to be something like motor torques and the observations have to be something like images, that might be a difficult space to do planning in. So we might say, ah, actually the planning idea is really useful, but it's more useful at a higher level of abstraction. So then we might say, oh, well, okay, what we'll do is we'll build some low level controllers. Maybe those are little policies and maybe I as an engineer can write those or maybe we can do some learning to find them. And then maybe what will be better is if I can do planning at a higher level of abstraction and my actions will be to call these low level controllers. It might also be that I'll wanna do some perception and estimation interpretation from the raw image stream to get a representation that's also useful for the more abstract level of planning. So there's an architectural maneuver. Um, and even then we might wanna add some more kind of hierarchical ability. And I'll talk a little bit about hierarchy later. So we as engineers can pick where we want to be in these classes of models. We can invent other ones too. But it's so one important decision to make when you're faced with a problem is what would be a good class of models? The next question is, well, if you pick a class of models, how are you going to actually decide for your particular uh, distribution of domains that you've been hired to make robots for, how do you decide what models uh, to, you know, what parameters, what, what the domain specific parts of those architectures I just showed you, how do you find them? So we have a bunch of different ways of approaching problems like this. Classical engineering is that, well, we just like write the stuff down, right? Classical engineering is awesome. Classical engineering lets Atlas do parkour, right? So, uh, there's lots of things you can do by uh, understanding your problem well, understanding science and math, and just kind of writing down good control structures. Um, there's another sort of surprising thing that actually occupies the same niche in the sense that there's a reasonably clear specific thing that you're supposed to do and you know everything about the problem, right? And, and that's actually, to use reinforcement learning. So it seems a little funny, like why would you ever use reinforcement learning in a situation where you know everything about the problem? Uh, and so I just wanna talk about that for a minute. So why would you use reinforcement learning when you know everything about the problem? Well, the answer is that it's, um, it's a way to take a representation of your problem or your domain or even a domain distribution uh, that you, can make easily, right? So it might be easy for engineers to make a simulator, but difficult for engineers to intuit what the controller should be. So in the example of the robot manipulating the Rubik's cube, it might not be so hard to make a simulator for that robot, but it's quite difficult to write down the policy. So what we do is we make a simulation of the domain. We take a reinforcement learning algorithm, which is domain independent, couple them together, let it run for a while, and then what comes out is a policy. Then we put the policy in the actual robot and the policy does what it does. And the way I really think is the best way to think about what's going on here is that it's a kind of a compiler, right? This is a software only maneuver. This is a way to take an understanding of the domain in one form, that is to say a simulator, and turn it into an understanding of the domain in another form, that is a value function or a policy. And just a little editorializing here. Uh, if we're going to take this, if we're doing this for this reason, and I would argue that almost all the reinforcement learning papers that people are publishing right now kind of have this setting in mind, either implicitly or explicitly, that of course, while you're doing the learning, right, while the simulator is hooked up to a reinforcement learning algorithm, uh, it doesn't really matter how much reward you get because that reward is all just like uh, some process that's a computational process that doesn't really matter. And it doesn't matter how many interactions you do with the simulator, what matters really only is as a function of how much computation time you spend, how good is your policy, right? So not only is this a compiler, it's often a kind of an anytime compiler, right? I could run it for longer and I get a better policy and I wanna think about, well, how can I set things up so that if I work pretty hard computationally, I get a really good policy out. Okay, so reinforcement learning, one way to use reinforcement learning is to solve problems we already understand, uh, but we understand them in a different way, not in a way that lets us write the policy down. 
Uh, you could look at uh, alpha zero and then mu zero, which is a, a kind of a generalization as um, methods that can handle somewhat more complicated problems by doing some combination of planning online, right? They don't just learn the policy or just learn a value function. They do a kind of model predictive control together with some learned control information. And so they can handle, I would argue, problems that are more complicated in a certain kind of way. What I wanna do now is talk a little bit about a system that we have built uh, called hierarchical planning in the now. It's blue. Uh, blue means that it's completely hand engineered, so there's no learning here. Um, but it is, I think, interesting from the structural perspective, and it will eventually give us a point from which I think we can move upward. So let me just talk about that a little bit. So before I get deeply into the hierarchical planning in the now part, I want to talk a little bit about the planning part. Right? So in reinforcement learning, we really just talked about this notion that you can use reinforcement learning to derive a policy. And generally speaking, we do it by making a simulator. And so there's a little bit of you know, back and forth at the moment between the reinforcement learning people and the planning people about who has to do more of what kind of work in order to make their approach go. So I just wanna kind of talk about that a little bit. So think about these two engineers. So there's the one engineer who is doing the reinforcement learning kind of approach to something. And then there's this other engineer who's gonna to try to build a system by constructing uh, models for a planner uh, instead of by doing the reinforcement learning. So the question is, what work do these two different engineers have to do? So the first thing that they have to do, or one thing they have to do, is the RL person has to figure out how to specify a reward function for their problem, and the planning person has to figure out how to specify a goal for their problem. And so the reward function is interesting. So we spent a little bit of time recently looking at the meta world suite of reinforcement learning problems. So this is actually a pretty nice, interesting set of problems designed in particular for meta learning. That is to say, could we build a system that could train effectively on five of these problems kind of offline and make it, or on 40, excuse me, on 45 of these problems, so most of them, and then given a new problem, learn very quickly because of having induced some generalities about the set of problems. So that's a very interesting setup and, and so on. We're not treating this as a learning problem at all. We just were kind of intrigued by the set of robot tasks. So these tasks all involve uh, manipulating some objects with a, a Sawyer robot. Some are pick and place, some involve pulling handles or rotating things and so on. And a question we could ask is, could we just do those with planning? So that was the question we asked ourselves. So first of all, we went and we looked inside to try to figure out what the goals were. And we're really kind of surprised at the reward function, right? So the reward function is where in a reinforcement learning problem, you specify what the goal is. But this is a reward function in meta world for pick and place. Um, and it's kind of complicated. It had at least 12 constants in it. And it actually has memory, right? So this is the reward function that an engineer had to write down, uh, had to say something like, well, if you don't have the object yet, um, you should be rewarded for moving your hand toward the object. But if you're really close to the object and you still don't have it, you should be rewarded for closing your fingers. And then if you have actually picked it up, then you should be rewarded for being kind of up high and moving over and so on. So it's, it, it's almost like a little program. Uh, for picking up the object, but but not quite. Right? So, uh, oh, sorry, I, yeah, so, okay, so that's the reward function. So uh, now I'm just being slightly obnoxious. I'll say the way that we describe the reward function for that same problem in our domain is something like this, which is that my goal is for the pose of this object to be there. So I think it might be easier to describe that goal than the reward function. Um, in both cases, we need the URDF. We need a description of the kinematics of the robot. We need to know where the objects are. Now, in the RL case, the RL algorithm doesn't need to know that, but the simulator does. Um, in our case, in the planning case, the URDF has to come in. It's part of, in some sense, the transition model of the domain. Uh, the simulator also needs physics. Uh, so that's, and, and 
that's roughly what you need for reinforcement learning. For the, for the planning approach, we need more, right? So this is still more, more the planning engineer. Planning engineer had an easy time with the goal and an okay time with the URDF. The place where the planning engineer has to do really more work is in um, specifying in particular this level of abstraction of control. Right. So at least for us to make our approach work, we need to define some a few low-level controllers, and we need to describe a level of abstraction uh, that the planner can use in order to plan how to deploy those controllers. So I'm going to talk about a way of doing that next. So right, you could try to do planning in a raw space, but that's not a good idea. So instead, I'm going to talk about an abstract model. Um, the this. Mostly what's important to think about here is why it's useful to make abstract models and how you what it means to pick a good one. And so when I want to pick some kind of an abstraction for solving a problem, well, presumably I pick the abstraction because it's going to make my computational problem easier. Um, and it's guaranteed to make my solutions worse, but I hope not too much worse, right? So that's the trade-off. Uh, and it should be hopefully not too hard to implement or kind of maintain the abstraction and hopefully it will apply to most of the problems you care about, probably not all of them. So a principle for building abstractions that I've become very enthusiastic about lately is the underlying view that is taken in multimodal motion planning. So I want to talk about that a little bit. So for now, although I think that this view can be generalized. It's kind of metaphorically, at least, generalized to a bunch of other kinds of problems. But more concretely, uh, let's for right now assume that the robot and the objects are kinematic chains in some kind of three-dimensional workspace, right? So I'm going to commit to that. Uh, I'm not going to be able to solve problems that involve blobs of gas or two dimensions or 12 dimensions. I'm like, here I am in three space. Uh, and that I have a state, and I'm going to represent the state in terms of poses and properties of objects in the robot. So. Let's talk about what a mode is. Right? So if we think about a robot and a bunch of objects on a table or in a house or a whole house, uh, you can see that as a problem with a very big configuration space. right? There's all the possible joint angles of the robot, but there's all the positions and orientations and configurations of all the objects in the world. So it's a very high dimensional state space. But Generally speaking, we can only change a very small subset of those dimensions at once. Right? So I can't just like look at my coffee cup and make it move. I have to actually move myself over there. And then when I'm touching it, I can make it move. So we can think about the problem in general of, the, of describing the dynamics of this whole complicated world in terms of describing the dynamics of a bunch of modes and then ways of switching between modes. And so a mode, you can think of a mode as a small set of state variables that pretty much always includes the robot's configuration, but maybe also some configuration variables of other objects. Uh, and that those inside the mode, I can manipulate all those variables, but the other ones stay fixed. And the, the dynamics are reasonably smooth. It's easy to plan inside a mode. So, um, let me just talk about an example here. Uh, I love this picture. This picture comes from a recent paper. This idea is actually older and due probably to Chris Hauser, or maybe, I don't know if that's exactly the original, but probably. Um, but there's a paper that has a figure that I like that's recent. Uh, so you can think of this high dimensional configuration space with the configuration variables of the robot and all the objects uh, as being a, a very high dimensional space. And a mode, uh, is a very low dimensional manifold embedded in that high dimensional space. So the simplest mode, that green mode, might be the mode where I'm not touching anything. I can move my arms around and I can change my state variables, but nobody else's state variables. So I can move around in that green manifold, and this is general robot motion planning, and control moves me around in the green manifold. But if I grasp my cup, uh, now I've entered a new mode. I've entered the pink mode now, because in the pink mode, not only can I control my state variables, I can control the state variables of this cup. Now there's a kind of, there's a, a relationship between the cup and my hand that has to stay constant and so on, but that's, that's a mode. And there's a notion of mode family, like so if I grasp the cup in a different way, then 
I'm kind of moving around on a pink slice, but it's kind of parallel to the pink slice I was in before. I can't easily move from one to the other. I can't easily change my grasp on this cup, uh, but it's a, it's a good way to think about the problem. So this gives us a handle on planning because we can design maybe controllers or low level policies for moving smoothly within modes. And we can kind of think at the high level uh, of planning about how to change between the modes, what modes, what families, what modes or mode families can we move through in order to solve our problem. So uh, we thought about the meta world problem and we modeled it as a multimodal motion planning problem with these mode families. So one mode family is this free space motion. One is picking up an object, right? That when I pick the object, I move from the mode where I'm free to the mode where I'm attached to the object. I move holding the object, I can put it down. Uh, I can push an object, that's kind of another mode family. Uh, and in this world, there are mechanisms that you can manipulate. They're just one dimensional kinematic mechanisms, things like doors and sliding drawers and so on. So we had, we had these four mode families. Um, and using that, we were able to solve a whole bunch of the meta world problems. Um, we did 43 out of the 50. Uh, uh, there are some of these examples that need a different mode, which where the robot kind of just rubs its hand on something and, and moves it. Uh, there's, there's pushing things into a hole, which we were just not set up to represent. And there's some tight insertions that I'm not sure a real robot could do, but uh, Mujoko is kind of forgiving. So, but we couldn't do those either. Um, but the thing is that we didn't have, there's no machine learning required, right? So there was, there was a lot of, there was engineering time, but the code is pretty general and it just solves all the problems. Like once you can solve two or three or four of them, then ones that are amenable to the same modes are just, they're easy to do for the engineer. Okay. So, uh, so what we did is we kind of made an instance of this architecture, uh, and we built in some basic algorithms and we built some models. And one other feature that I think is kind of important is the ability to do hierarchical planning. So in some sense there, we had like two levels of hierarchy in some sense, right? There's the maybe low level moving through modes and the high level deciding what the modes should be and so on. Um, if you wanted to clean up a very difficult kitchen or travel to another country when we can do that again, then you would not plan that whole activity down even at the level of mode switches. Um, so another thing that seems important to us is the idea of really doing hierarchical planning where you might start out with a high level goal, like, uh, I don't know, maybe I would like to go to Stanford. I would like to go to Stanford. Um, I was supposed to visit there this spring, but I didn't manage to get out there. So maybe I plan at a very high level that involves you know, going to the Boston airport and getting on an airplane and so on. And then what I can do is I can take that first step, which is let's say to get to the Boston airport and I can plan that out in more detail. And then I can take the first step of that, which is maybe to you know uh, get out of my building and plan in a little more detail for that. And then I can be an optimist. Uh, I'm gonna be an optimist. So being optimistic here means that I am gonna actually begin executing my plan to get to the airport before I've worked out in detail exactly how I'm going to walk through the San Francisco airport, or indeed how I'm going to get from San Francisco to Stanford or something like that. Right? So uh, we have a, a structure that lets us make plans and reevaluate them if they're not working and so on. Uh, and it, it gives a fair amount of robustness. So now I'm going to show you a robot video. Um, I have to give the following disclaimer, which is that pretty much any individual thing that this robot does um, some smart undergraduates could get the robot to do in a week or two uh, better. All right, so that's okay. But then, the, uh, so what's interesting about this is that it's basically the same code that's doing a whole bunch of problems and so that each new problem doesn't require very much work at all. Um, so just, I'll narrate this, you know, here we told the robot to put that blue box where the can is. It looked and it saw something was in the way, it picked up the can, took it out of the way, put the blue box where it needs to go. Here we told it to put the green box on the corner of the table. It can't pick up the green box, it's too big. It figured out it had to push it. It realized it had to move the other one out of the way. It knows it's pushing is really unreliable. So it also looks after each push to check to see if it worked out and it's doing replanning. Here we told it to go outside of the lab. Again, it looked and it found these chairs in the way. 
So moved one chair out of the way and then unknown to us, it grabs this chair and then just brings it with it. Like uh, that, we did not tell it to do that, but we didn't tell it not to either. So that's what it did. Here it's looking for a full oil bottle. It has to gather information by picking the oil bottles up and seeing which one's heavy to know which one's full. Um, this is a, a, I don't know, some kind of a silly task. And then I think just in the next movie, we'll see that it actually, we got it running on a different robot in a different lab without too much difficulty. Okay, so I said I was gonna kind of talk about robots and learning and so on. And now I showed you this robot doing all these things. Uh, there is no learning in this robot. So Tomas and I, so two old professors wrote most of the code. Um, and the only learning that happened was that we learned some things while we wrote the code. But what we did learn, I think, was some principles and ideas about an architecture that we think would be useful for solving fairly complicated long horizon problems. Um, so that was our arc of planning in the now. So that's that blue no learning box. So now let's talk about what happens when we're uncertain about the domain a little bit. And we'll just briefly remember that reinforcement learning was designed originally to deal with the problem where you have an agent that knows almost, that knows very little about the domain that it's going to operate in. And it has to do learning, but it has to do learning in the actual world. Um, and so, you know, but okay, so this is just a cheap shot, right? But you don't want the robot doing reinforcement learning in your kitchen from scratch, right? You don't want it to learn physics from scratch in your world. Uh, so, if you're doing really online reinforcement learning, that's an interesting problem, but you have to be very, very careful. And in particular, now every single reward matters. There's no grace period where you get to like break things for a while. Oh, maybe little kids get to break things a little bit. Uh, not too many, you hope. Um, so you could break things maybe for a little while, but not too long, but the reward really matters. Um, so that's a really interesting regime, but I think most practical engineering problems don't really live in that part of the space. Um, there are lots of good and interesting attempts to kind of think about what it means to be in between here, where you know something about the class of domains, but not too much. And Bayesian reinforcement learning or meta reinforcement learning are good ways of addressing that. What I want to do now is to just articulate a little bit uh, a research direction that we're taking, which is roughly to try to uh, extract the architectural and algorithmic ideas from, let's say, the hierarchical planning and the now system, but throw away most of the domain dependent models and think about how we could learn those instead so that we wouldn't have to do hand coding for each new domain. But in the factory, we could do some learning of pieces and parts for a new category of domains that could then be put together compositionally. OK, so the question is, if we adopt this architecture, instead of hand building those things in yellow and some other stuff, what could we learn? So I'm going to go, in the interest of having time for conversation, I'm going to go really quickly through this part. Uh, I'm happy to answer more questions later or point you to technical papers to read. Um, so one thing that we can do is learn new operator models. So one thing is if you look at the current robot learning literature, lots of people are working on learning policies, learning controllers for cutting or stirring or catching a ball in a cup or doing reasonably low dimensional, reasonably smooth, reasonably short horizon problems. And that stuff is working very well. And we're not going to work on it because we don't like to work on problems that other people are doing because they'll probably do it better. So we're doing something else. The something else is to say, OK, you can learn to cut a vegetable or to stir something. How can we figure out models of those skills so that we can put them together to solve new problems? Um, so we'll take pouring as an example. So imagine that you learned a controller. Someone else learned a controller for pouring. Our problem now is going to be to learn a model of that controller so that we can use it flexibly and reliably. So maybe we want to learn, we want to say, OK, this controller, it's supposed to cause liquid to be from one, uh, be, go from one vessel into another one. And I have this pouring skill. Maybe it has a gain parameter. 
And there's a bunch of preconditions like, oh, the source cup has liquid in it and I'm holding it maybe in a certain way. And the source container has a shape, the destination container has a shape. There's some relative pose of these things. So there's a bunch of continuous parameters that describe my goal, the current situation, the controller I'm gonna use. And I want to learn a representation. I wanna learn a constraint, a relation on all those continuous parameters, such that if that relation holds, if that constraint on all those parameters holds, then if I execute the skill with those with that gain parameter and uh, the stuff will go where it's supposed to go. If I can come up with a representation like this, then I can take that pouring operation and put it in the robot's repertoire of existing operations and it can just use it as needed. It doesn't need to relearn its own kinematics. It doesn't need to relearn grasping. It doesn't relearn, need to relearn anything else. It can just add something to what it already knows. So that's our goal. We treat this problem, the problem of learning that constraint, uh, we say, okay, well, we can imagine trying pouring in a bunch of different circumstances. We can score each of those pours as to how well it worked or not. And then we try to learn a mapping from all those variables that describe the situation of the pouring into how well it worked. We use Gaussian processes to do this, partly because it helps us do information gathering more efficiently, and partly because at the end of this learning phase, we would like to know the region of the, that constraint space where we believe we can reliably execute a pour. Now, you might say, actually, let's just go back to this thing for a minute. You might say, why do you want to learn? This is going to try to learn all the possible arrangements of pouring that could work out, right? We're trying to say, uh, what, what are the conditions under which pouring will work? The reason that we really want to know that is that we would like, we know that if we just learn one way of pouring, maybe you have a favorite way a favorite grasp of your favorite cup. You just like have a way of pouring that you really like and you're really good at it and that's good. But I feel sure that if I made you pour with your left hand or with an obstacle in the way or from a funny picture you didn't understand very well, you would be able to figure out a way to do it. So we would like to understand the whole kind of locus of successful pouring operations, not just the one. So we wanna do that and we wanna know what part of that space we're certain about. We do some fancy stuff to keep a representation of this GP and to uh, gather information in a way that's focused on finding the boundaries of success. Um, we find that the way we do it works better than some other ways, including one of those other ways is the way Tomas and I first did it. The students did it better than we did. Um, that's not surprising. Uh, so then we trained a real robot to do some stuff here, pouring and scooping. What's entertaining about this is that um, the data collection is like non-trivial, right? So here we have the robot trying to figure out uh, how well it works to do scooping and pouring in various ways. And we had to pick up a lot of chickpeas from the robot, from the lab, uh, in order to actually eventually gather all this data. So, okay, so we learn some operations. We learn models of how the operations work. We throw them into a general purpose multimodal motion planner. Uh, with our other abilities to do things. And now we can ask the robot to solve a bunch of problems. Um, here we can put objects on the table in kind of pretty much any arrangement. And we ask it to put stuff in this bowl or another bowl, it doesn't matter too much which. Um, here we asked it to serve the bowl on the tray with stuff in it. There it moved the green box out of the way. We didn't tell it to do that, but it knew it had to do it so that it could pick up the stuff. Um, uh, pick up the cup that had the stuff in it and pour. Um, here we said it had to put the cup on top of that block and so on. I'll show you one more example, which I like. Um, so it in this next one, uh, it realizes that the bowl needs to be in the workspace for the pouring. So the planner just synthesized this plan that said, oh, let me push the bowl into the workspace and then let me pour into it, right? Oh, <laughs> did you see where it put the cup? Yeah. Um, so this is like pretty general purpose and that makes us happy. Uh, what you might have seen there is that I had to kind of hand structure the rule. I picked out which 
properties of which objects were important in making the predictions. We've done some other work on trying to automatically figure out which properties of which objects are important. Um, uh, we have done some work, beginning work, on trying to cache, right? So one thing that you might worry about when you say, oh, I'm going to run a planner inside my control loop at multiple levels of hierarchy is that that might be pretty slow. Um, and of course, what we imagine is that as the robot repeats the same kind of problem over and over again, it will begin to cache parts of that policy so that the routine things become more efficient. Um, and we've been working on search control, right? So just by analogy with um, alpha zero and, and those kinds of models, although we may be doing a search, we could also do learning that helps us search more efficiently. Um, and so some work in the context, again, of the multimodal motion planning is we have this kind of difficult search problem, which involves picking discrete choices, like which operation to do on which object, and continuous choices, like which particular parameters to use, uh, which grasp or where to place an object. And so something we've been thinking about lately, and that's very important to us, is, is, is generalizing aggressively. So we might imagine that the robot learns in this apartment domain here to move one or more boxes into the kitchen area. And we would like that what it learns to generalize to moving objects around inside a cupboard. The trajectories will be very different. The detailed geometry, the scale is different and so on. But fundamental ideas that things are in my way need to get moved out of the way, that's still true. Um, and so we did some work on trying to learn uh, Q values for the abstract action choices. Under the assumption that the continuous parameters were going to get picked by another mechanism, we can still try to answer the question, would it be good to move this object now or that object now? So that, we hope, will generalize better than trying to learn over discrete, learn over the, the detailed continuous values, which are very, very geometry dependent in a way that's difficult to represent for learning. Um, and so again, there are details. We use a graph neural network to represent a value function. And we do some stuff. And it works better than some other things. OK. So what we're hoping, uh, eventually, the grand design is to like be able to bootstrap a robot from basic understanding that there are objects in the world uh, and, and compositionally and continually learn skills and concepts and properties, right? So we might start out and say, I believe that objects have positions in the, in the world. And I'm going to pick this property, the position of an object. And I'm going to see if I can learn some policies that change that property. And I can begin to make a model. I can use that model to make plans. If I make a plan, I can execute it. Uh, if it works, that's great. If it doesn't work, I get information about why my model was wrong. If I'm unable to plan to achieve something, then maybe I can diagnose something that's missing in my memory and formulate a, a problem for myself. Uh, maybe I formulate that I need a new primitive skill. Like this object seems to be stuck to the table. Maybe I need a new primitive skill, which is how to unstick something. And maybe I could formulate that as a reinforcement learning problem and apply reinforcement learning methods that we understand. Um, so that we hope that we could eventually end up with a loop of of defining new properties that seem important, defining new latent properties, learning to predict them, learning to cause them, and build up models of the robot's general competence that could be used to solve a wide variety of tasks. OK, so I'm going to finish. I, the finishing slide here is I, I did the cheap trick. I gave a talk uh, a long time ago at Ichikai, um, and I had a conclusion slide. And so I just copied that slide. Uh, but I'll make a few amendments. But here's my slide, right? There's been a lot of progress in algorithms for supervised reinforcement learning. That's true. It was true then. Now it's like super true now. Uh, so I, I gave a talk at Ishkai recently, which is why I, I did this. So re now we've really made a ton of progress on this kind of learning. Back then, I said it didn't really give us solutions for making autonomous agents. And I think that that's still true. Uh, I think it still doesn't really. The, the learning uh, has helped us, but it's still not really helping us solve general purpose uh, autonomous agents. Then I thought we needed human insight of some sort to complement the strengths of those algorithms. 
back in the day, people, when people talked about building in knowledge or bias to a, ro a learning algorithm, a particular robot learning algorithm, they really thought about building in something like facts. Now I think that what we need to build in is something more like algorithms, right? Uh, convolution is a great example, right? That's al convolution is an algorithm and a structural bias that if you build it into your visual learning system, it makes your visual learning system work a lot better. I think certain kinds of estimation and planning algorithms, we will also want to build in and learn the models for. Um, so with this, I will say thanks to lots of people, uh, Tomas, my collaborator, lots of students, and I will let you watch the robot make mistakes. And then I am happy to answer questions or move into the panel discussion. Okay, maybe we don't want to watch the robot making mistakes. It's always kind of fun though. This, this is this is how you know this is real, right? Like we did not hand code anything, or we would not have had this enormous blooper reel to show you. Okay, I'll quit now. Um, uh, let's see. And then we'll stop. Sharing. Great job, Leslie. Um, thank you very much. It was a fantastic talk. Um, I'm very. Uh, um, very nice distillation of the. Uh, 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 the relationship between planning and uh, and learning. Uh, thanks for that. Um, let me start with um, maybe a, a, a general question. And I wanted to go back to this idea of uh, multimodal abstractions, uh, which you mentioned in the context of uh, motion planning, but I guess it's general, this general idea that there is, that exists a set of um, um, maybe discrete abstractions, um, and I, I wanted to ask you whether that is whether that is an assumption that we're making, or whether there's truthness to that. That we live in a world where there's there's sort of this small number of abstractions uh, that is manageable, or whether that is a self-fulfilled um, prophecy because we like thinking about robotics that way. Uh, what is what is your take on that? Yeah, good. I think it's totally a self-fulfilling prophecy. I mean, I think we as human engineers need, well, no, there's multiple pieces. Okay, so one part of it is the self-fulfilling prophecy part. We as human engineers can only understand things that are a certain amount complicated because we can only fit certain stuff in our head at once. So if we're gonna build a thing, the methodology we use has to be understandable uh, in, in pieces and parts. Now it could be, that we're gonna, the methodology will be understandable in those terms, but the artifact that gets built will not, right? So if we design, if we design an evolutionary algorithm, that evolutionary algorithm might have modularity, but the things it makes might not. Um, so I'm not committed to whether the thing in the end that gets made has modularity, but I'm certainly committed to the fact that the process that we use has to. I don't think that we can get out of that. Now, the thing is though, lucky for us, humans who live in the world we live in, uh, we don't have, um, our, act, our ability to affect objects in the world is actually fairly localized. Uh, and, and so the fact is that I can't actually just simultaneously move all the objects in my kitchen. Uh, I mean, if I could physically, I probably couldn't cognitively. And so it's okay for me if the robot can't do that either. Now, the question about discrete, so I don't believe, so these abstractions are not discrete necessarily. Um, and I don't think that there's a fixed repertoire. I mean, you know, we implemented four to do that thing. I think if you learn a new, like a new hobby, you'll learn a few more, right? If you, I, I like, for some reason I've been using soldering and cooking as examples, right? If you came over and you didn't know how to solder and I needed to teach you to solder, You'd have to learn the motor skill, you'd have to, you, and so that's like another little package and you'd put that package somehow in your repertoire of packages of stuff. Thanks, cool. I guess um, oh, but, okay. I can ask Albert a follow-up question on that, um, on the point of representations and so on. So in my understanding, it's still up to the engineer to design this representation, to select what are these abstractions for computational reasons. Is there any hope that we can come up with an algorithm saying that you know, we will partition the state space in a clever way to make computation feasible? Oh yeah, no, so what I'm hoping, 
the only thing I want to build in is that there are abstractions, but not the particular ones. Well, I might, and then I might need to, I might need a few for bootstrapping. It's interesting uh, talking with Josh Tenenbaum and a little bit then with Liz Spelke, who's uh, an expert on child development and so on. There's good reason to think, I think apparently that like even mammals are born with the idea that there are objects in the world uh, and even other agents and that they're embedded in three space. So like, I am totally willing to build that stuff in. Um, but I think if I even could just start with the notion that objects have uh, locations in space, I could learn motor policies that change those features. And then I could learn a model of when those motor policies work. And then I could learn new motor policies that try to achieve the conditions under which those things work. So, or this is related to, to kind of the, some work that we did with George Conadaris on, you know, George had this nice work on skill chaining and we worked on also thinking about how does that induce higher level of abstractions. So I, th I think that we could make a bootstrapping thing that would need some very generic algorithmic ideas and just a few like starting kernels. But I don't want to start from like nothing. At least I don't. I understand. I can sympathize with people who do, but I, that's, I don't. It seems, yeah, I agree with you. It seems an overkill to, uh, you know, not to use prior knowledge that we have. At the same time, it would be kind of nice to have a framework in which these kind of concepts emerge in a very, like, you know, natural way. But, you know, I, I really feel what you're saying. So I completely agree. Well, I think, so I, I, I think that what's important, I think that that's really interesting, like super cool to figure out how could these things emerge from nothing. I just think that then what's critical is that when anybody writes a paper, they should say what their objective is. So if you say my objective is understanding how these things can come from nothing, then I'm like, yeah, that's awesome. If you say my objective is to develop a robot engineering strategy, I might say, mm, I'm not sure. Completely, completely agree. Yeah, the representation should really come from the task that uh, the robot is assigned to. Um, so if you guys want to follow up with a question which is, uh, which is uh, switching to the topic of computation, and it's a little bit of a provocation for Leslie, but you know, at the beginning of the of the of the presentation, you mentioned something that really uh, resonated with uh, with uh, my thinking. So you mentioned that there are a number of problems in robotics. You're referring to decision making, which the formulation is there, right? So the formulation is pretty clear, it's pretty elegant, it's pretty simple. What we are missing is really the way to solve it. So there is uh, really a bad computational problem that we have to solve, and computing becomes the bottleneck over there. So the, the provocative question I have for you is, uh, um, will this problem just go away with better computers? If you can design chips, maybe, or we can design like you know, a quantum computer in the future, can we just go to the beach now and wait for this? Um, I'm slightly confused because I actually don't think we have very many of those problems. Well, I guess, I guess Name you- three. You you um, you hinted at the beginning that uh, you know the computation of the policy is tough, and if you want, most of the question about getting the right abstraction is a computational problem. Ah uh, ah uh, uh, okay good. So here's the computational problem: the way to solve all robot engineering problems is to take the spec, enumerate programs from simple to complicated until you find one that meets the spec. Okay, so that's an algorithm that will solve every problem. Due to Jürgen Schmidhuber. No, it's not due to him, but he's certainly written a lot about it. Um, so that's now, okay, so now I've reduced all of robotics to a computational problem, kind of. Not all, I mean, all of the software part of robotics. But that is a problem whose complexity scaling is so, so, so bad that then the answer to your other question is no, I don't think even quantum computers can take enough logs to make that algorithm practical. Yeah, I guess uh, complexity, you know, complexity theory thing is helping us. So that was more of a hint also for, for us, a motivation for the young researchers, I guess, in the audience. I think complexity will tell oh, yeah. us there's just yeah. as much we can do. And, and I think there is actually something even deeper that, uh, you know, the more we go over the years, the more we're going to ask to the robots. So, you know, computation will barely catch up with what we want from our robots. Right. That has like, been the pattern. Yeah. I do also have a question about uh, abstractions. First of all, I loved your idea of uh, multi-model motion planning, but 
and we talked, uh, and actually we mentioned a few times the idea of uh, the right abstraction. But do you have a, a systematic way to reason more quantitatively about what we mean by the right uh, abstraction? Uh, what are the different dimensions we should account for? And mm -hmm. how those dimensions could be quantitative so that maybe in the long run we could come up with uh, what Luca was mentioning, a more algorithmic, automated way of uh, computing the right abstraction. But first of all, we should define what the right abstraction really is. Right. No, that's good. Um, I mean, some actually, Michael Lippmann and George Kanadaris and I think Stephanie Talex also, they've been working on this a little bit in the context of MDPs. Um, so fundamentally, I think I, I had a list on one of my slides. Okay, so what makes an abstraction good? It should, I mean, so, so it should ease your computational burden and not mess up your answers too much. But fundamentally, that's it, right? Because it's gonna, it's gonna make your answers worse. Um, I mean, unless your domain has some miraculous properties, right? So you can, you can write down an objective function uh, that says, uh, you know, alpha times computation time plus beta times how much my solutions are suboptimal. And then now you have a search problem, but it's a terrible search problem. Right. Again, you could enumerate abstractions and see which one is good. But then the difficult, now it's an algorithmic question of, do we have any, any leverage on that? Do we have any way to find a good abstraction? Right. And do you have any insight in this regard, whether this is a desperately complicated problem or there are some way to crack it? I don't. I mean, what I I have just the, a glimmer of an intuition that we might. Well, I, I mean, I don't think a lot of people are approaching this problem thinking, saying, I have this big old problem and I would like to make an abstraction of it. And I think that seems very difficult to me. In particular, how did you acquire the big old problem without? I mean, if it was so big, you couldn't acquire it anyway and you don't need the abstraction, maybe. Um, but so I really, the thing that appeals to me is, is incrementality and bootstrapping. So can we build little bits of policy and strategy that achieve conditions in the world pretty reliably? So one thing is I think, oh, determinism, right? So if we're looking for abstractions of, of, of behavior, uh, picking things that we can achieve deterministically, I think that's actually a, a principle that's really important. It's like, why do I like bags? I like bags because I can put something in the bag with probability one. I can put something in the bag, right? I can't put it at any particular location, but I can put it in the bag. And I also know if it's in the bag and I move the bag, it comes with the bag. That bags are a great abstraction, right? Because I don't have to think about it because they're reliable. So thinking about things that funnel or that we have good controllers for, good, 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 you know, attractors in, in dynamics. I think those are the basis for making abstractions. We like the digital abstraction in computing because because sure. uh, we can you, you can kind of keep it true. And if you can kind of keep it, like if, you, if everything's in a bag, you're good, right? So, so the answer is I don't really know, but I kind of think that you can, there's, there might be some bottom up way of, of doing it. Very good, thank you. You're muted, Alberto. Excellent. <laughs> I think we're gonna transition to some of the questions from the audience. Uh, uh, Ransalo. Yeah, hey, talk, Leslie. Uh, we have a couple of questions about explainability and interpretability. So one question is, in, in RL in factory versus planning, in the planning approach more interpretable than RL? This could matter a lot in safety critical applications. So what are your thoughts on that? I think that might be right. I mean, just because an engineer had to design that stuff. And so if human had to design it, then it's gonna be already kind of in terms that are more easy to articulate. Um, right, I think post hoc, explanations of what a policy that's acquired automatically does is, is very difficult. There are people who work on it, but I don't, yeah, I think, I think the planning approach does make it easier to explain. Mm -hmm. We have uh, a question from Lucas Manually. Uh, 
that's been, uh, I guess, voted by a lot of our viewers and building a little bit on the conversation with uh, Professor Pavone. Um, so maybe low level policies like pouring and slicing consume different representation than task and motion planning. Uh, is there a unifying representation? Um, I think there may not be a unifying representation. So, so brains are like not uniform bags of goo, right? So different parts of brains have different connectivity and certainly the areas that are well understood, like to so the, the visual areas, um, you know, I think it's, it's kind of clear that the structure is matched to the problem. You can think of the structure as implementing some generic algorithmic something. And so I think it's totally plausible that the algorithms for learning and applying uh, control strategies at the low level with a closed loop are just different from the algorithms and structures for doing the higher level stuff. I think that's okay. I don't think that we need one thing. Great. I think we have uh, another question. We have actually many questions, but probably the next one is from James. Yep. Uh, thanks, Leslie, for the great talk. So this is paraphrasing um, a, a question uh, from the chat, uh, which was posted anonymously. Um, and it's related to your uh, example of hierarchical, hierarchical planning in the now, uh, where your, your robot sort of took a chair and, and moved it along. So the question is kind of saying, uh, how could we formalize the notion that we don't want our robot to disrupt the environment too much? Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, if your robot's making tea, how can you say, go into the kitchen, make the tea, don't take everything out of the shelves, et cetera? And my follow-up question would be, how do you see this interacting with curiosity or a, a process which actively explores the environment? Yeah, okay, now that's a really good question. So I've been thinking, I mean, for a long time I've thought about that, right? So exactly, so if you have a household robot and you say, robot, make me, Sudo, make me a sandwich, uh, you don't mean at all costs, right? You don't mean that it's okay to kill the cat or to uh, steal things from the neighbors or like there's a whole range of things that's completely not okay. Uh, and how do you specify that, right? It's clear that you can't, you can't even transmit your whole objective function to the robot. So it feels like this is something that has to happen in the factory. So that so, so the, the, the metaphor I have, I don't have any technical solution to this problem, but what I would love is to be able to say that there's some kind of like background utility function, which we build in in the factory or learn or build in some combination of some very, some background utility. And you'd also like to compile it to some degree, I think. Like, if, you know, so we have this high level background utility, which is like, don't die and don't break stuff. But we have that already cached into some more uh, specific things. Like, we all cringed when the robot put the cup down on the very edge of the table, right? Um, and that's because we've compiled the like, don't break stuff into some other constraints that are maybe more short horizon and easier to like to, to avoid. So could you take a very generic utility function and do some work in the factory offline, maybe slowly, to compile it into some constraints that the robot could use and then layer, when you say make me a sandwich, could it then like layer the make me a sandwich objective on top of that and then solve? So like, I don't know how to do that, but I agree it is a super important question. Um, Curiosity is another interesting thing that we've been thinking about a bit in our group. Um, a lot of, but so, okay. So curiosity, curiosity and simulation is totally fine. Do whatever you want to, it's okay. Curiosity in the real world has to take place with a lot of scaffolding, right? Um, so even, so humans, and, and bears, I don't know. I mean, so they're curious to some degree, little bear cubs, right? But they also have a ton of reflexes that again, got built in by nature to keep them from doing completely ridiculous and dangerous things. And then anyone with small children knows that you have to actually apply a lot of constraints so that the curiosity doesn't become dangerous, right? For ro and, and the question is, what is it? for, right? So bigger question is like, what is the curiosity for? Uh, and Laura Schultz uh, is a cognitive psychologist who has a bunch of kind of interesting theories about that. Apparently a bunch of the obvious ideas don't seem to be true in humans. Um, but uh, uh, 
so because it's exploration that you kind of do in your free time i think of it sometimes i like to call it null space exploration it's like you're trying to do something but then you have some free time at the moment for whatever reason and then you do some random stuff not because you're trying to do a thing so it's not like information gathering that's for a purpose it's like ah well i seem to have some free time let me just figure some stuff out and then maybe it'll be useful but i think nature i mean the some offline process has to decide how to manage that information gathering and what is good and what what are the objectives and how to do it relative to constraints so that you don't endanger yourself. So I don't have anything super clear to say about that, but that's it's a it's a good question. Can I maybe ask a, a quick follow up just sure. about this notion of background utility? Um, so so learning in this background utility and simulation seems plausible in terms of interacting with physical objects uh in terms of you want to learn now not to break a mug because then you can't learn it later um at a at a very you know at a thirty-five thousand foot view how do you see this working with uh interaction with human beings uh so this seems very hard to simulate so how do you think you could learn a background utility for for robot to human interaction you mean like not hitting them in the head or do you mean understanding what they want in life? Uh, well, the former seems easier to learn than the latter, uh, but maybe something in the middle of those of those two things. Yeah, okay. You know, I I, I want to learn about a human, but a human would probably be annoyed if my robot just just poked them over and over again to gauge what the response would be. Yeah, no, that's right. Um, well, so there's folk psychology, right? So I mean, I think at 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 some low level, there's the just in simulation, I could hit people and, and they could be mad at me. I mean, I think you could do a certain amount of that stuff in simulation. Um, but then again, it's like, you know, if you, again, if you talk to Liz Belke, who understands infant cognition, her view is that, that again, mammals are born with the idea that there are other agents. I mean, maybe not a fancy theory of other agents, but there are other actors in the world. And certainly humans quite quickly can understand, can put themselves in the place of that other actor. And that is very powerful. Because if you could put yourself in the place of the other actor, then you can say, well, would I like it if they hit me in the head? Or what would I want if I were in that situation? And so I think this putting yourself in somebody else's shoes is the, is the way that we manage complicated interactions with other humans. And I think we'll have to do that with the robot. Now, what's difficult is, of course, the humans, but then you have to have some understanding of the human's utility. And we, the, we sometimes it doesn't work out very well, but generally we assume that other people have roughly the same utility function that we do. Um, and that's okay, because we know our utility. The robot and a human will have different utility functions and figuring out how that goes is complicated, right? The robots will have to know something about general human utility. I guess now we're back to the question of how can they learn that? By watching? I don't know, that's hard, it's hard. Oh, we have a question from Ariel Anders uh, that maybe we can move to, uh, who's asking, uh, well, she would like to hear more about uh, the last comment on building, not building in facts, but rather building algorithms. Hi, Ari. She was one of my students. Um, more about that. Well, it, it, I think it's, it's just when we try to build in facts about the world, at least for low level things, right? So I think if we were making higher level robots, maybe this would be less true. I don't know. It's been, what I can say is it has been more successful when people build in algorithmic structures and reasoning methods and learn models generally than when they build in the models. Now, if you go to the very, very high level, like, uh, you know, how do I know that the mitochondria are the power plant of the cell? I know that because I read it in my seventh grade science textbook. And that is just a fact that got put in my head in some way. Um, so so I, think at, I think maybe the higher, the more abstract the knowledge and the more maybe close to textual or something, then the more that we could plausibly build it in. But that for kind of manipulation things and motor things and even sort of a lot of that common sensey stuff that happens 
in the physical world that we don't know how to build in at the factual level. So we have a question about causal relationships from Ishank. Would we gain from making incorporation of human biases and insights systematic through the language of causal relationships? Wait, I heard all the words, but I didn't quite get the question. Can you just say it again? Right. So would we gain from making the incorporation of human insight, human biases and insights systematic through the language of causal relationships. So like if, if we use causal relationships, the language of causal relationship would, would we gain anything? Well, causality is really, really important for the robot, right? I mean, if the robot wants to cause things, that's its like goal in life. Um, and so causal reasoning is critical. Uh, it's easier, I mean, a lot of the angst in a certain, like in this, when scientific people or causal discovery worry about finding causal relationships, it's hard for them because they have to worry about doing interventions and interventions are costly and, I, and, and there's that whole piece of reasoning. But the robot intervenes like every, all the, every moment the robot is intervening on the world. And so it has like all the causal inference data that it could need and that it absolutely has to do causal reasoning. Um, so, uh, and, and I guess, so another question is, well, could you, could you gain, could you benefit from humans telling you some causal facts or something? And again, the answer is maybe, but I think we're less good at knowing how to benefit from that kind of stuff than we are at benefiting from algorithmic stuff. Hey, Leslie. Hey. Uh, there's a question about how we should deal with perception and action uncertainties. Ah. Well, I enjoy uncertainty. Um, I figured. Yeah. So I think it's important. So perceptual uncertainty, right? So one thing that's really important is to be aware of your own uncertainty, right? So of course you're going to make errors in perception. Um, but really being able to quantify your uncertainty is critical, right? So that one thing, the reason that we can make that PR2 be reasonably robust doing stuff is that we are very aware at every moment in, in that stuff. In fact, all the planning was do done in state space, but in belief space, it was reasoning about what it knew about the world and how it could take actions to reduce its own uncertainty and so on. Being aware of your own uncertainty, I think is really, really critical. Um, and, so the question is, I mean, so th I think there's an important interface to people who work on perception and perception for robotics, right? Which is, I don't think we have a good agreement, a good understanding of what is a nice interface between perception and stuff that happens later. So like getting a bunch of bounding boxes, not so helpful maybe like, getting multiple interpretations, understanding what we would like to know. I think this is a coffee cup, or maybe it's a, something on top of another thing. Um, so getting output from perception that gives us more information already about its own uncertainties and then understanding how to incorporate that into some kind of, I think we need state estimation. This is another thing that uh, lots of people are not, I mean, I think we have to think hard about this and, and not to, not enough people are working on that. There's a lot of work on uh, state estimation for like navigation, but less work on state estimation for just the world around me uh, and what's going on with this pile of stuff in front of me or in my kitchen cupboard. And how do I take detections of objects or and depth maps and all this stuff and put it together into some kind of distributional interpretation over what's going on so that I can remember it for when I come back later so that I can update it based on new observations so that I can move something out of the way and see what happens. So I think that's a whole cluster of things that we could use more focus. Um, uh, and uncertainty in action is the same thing, right? So if you can model the uncertainty, the, the ways in which your actions are unreliable, then you can close the loop, right? You can do perception and then decide whether you, so the one thing that I've learned is that you can, you, 
that cl closing the loop solves a ton of problems, right? And people know this, control people know this very well. And they can have terrible models and make a little controller, but it usually often it's okay if you can just kind of fix the mistake you made last time, then you're okay. And more, a little bit more, fix the mistake you made and a little more. Um, people who do high level reasoning and thinking often don't have that ethos, right? They wanna come up with a plan and the plan should be good and you should be able to execute it from beginning to end and that's how that should go. So we, we take the control ethos up through all the planning we ever do. And we know that every plan we make is not going to like live for very long. We use the plan as a kind of a justification for the first step. And if we're lucky, the second step will be good too, but probably not, and that's okay. Great. Um, I think I'll, I'll use the opportunity to uh, squeeze in another question. Um, you, you kind of alerted this before. Um, when you were saying that, that we should be more proactive when we're writing our papers and having a statement saying, okay, this is the problem that I'm solving. And uh, in part, because we don't do that, there's many discussions that, uh, that we have in our community where um, we're just referring to different problems, right? They're, they're almost mm -hmm. kind of becoming belief systems. Uh, this is what I believe and this is, this is the problem we should solve and while someone else is talking about different one. Um, I think there's one that I'm, I'm, I'm interested in and I wanted to get your opinion. Um, so there's this big part of the community that sort of thinks or uh, is motivated by the fact that data is expensive, right? So capturing data is expensive uh, and that sort of motivates a certain kind of algorithms. But then there's <clears throat> this other big part of the community that is motivated by the fact that data is cheap right. and leads to a completely different set of algorithms. Um, where do you see it? How do you how do we resolve? How do we have a discussion that can bring both perspectives? Well, that's good, right? I mean, um, you know, and I think the fact is that different kinds of data come with different kinds of price tags, right? Uh, I mean, a nice kind of work that 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 tries to address that is like sim to real type stuff, where they say, well, okay, sim data is cheap and real data is expensive and I wanna figure out how to make them work together. Right? So that's nice because they're taking explicitly that trade off uh, into account. Um, uh, but you know, I think, well, so if you say my assumption is the data is expensive, you should name three domains where that's true. And if you say my assumption is the domain is that data is cheap, you should name three domains where that's true. And if you have trouble finding them, then you should find a different framework. Okay. Uh, hey, Leslie, I have a, a question related to um, to our previous discussion, and this is from Andrew S. in the chat. Uh, and the question is, uh, I'm in, well, it's a more of a statement. I'm interested in your perspective on the development paradigm uh, and developmental approaches to learning. So the importance of uh, a childhood phase uh, for a robot in terms of, this is, I guess, related to the notions of curiosity to safety and some of your previous discussion about uh, uh, childhood. Right. Well, okay, so I guess, I mean, again, with my pragmatist, so in the spirit of the previous conversation, I will wear my pragmatic robot engineering hat, not my it's cool to understand evolution hat, because I think it's cool, but so let's say I just want to make robots, right? Then kind of the, what I imagine is there's some stuff engineers can build in without doing too much harm. Maybe, you know, convolution and some algorithms and some architecture. There's some stuff we can learn in simulation uh moderately usefully and so that kind of maybe some basic developmental stuff we can either learn in simulation or with like ten thousand robots in padded rooms or something right so maybe you can kind of get a if you really need some real experience you can pay for that right uh and then maybe you could aggregate all that into like a really pretty competent robot that knows a lot of stuff. So the, the development would happen mostly in the factory. And then we could take that robot and come to your house and you'd say, hey, robot, actually in my house, this is how we do X and the robot doesn't know how to do X. But then hopefully it would be like almost as good as you would be if you came to my house and I tried to teach you a new, new way to do something. But the developmental process is something the robot should be doing and so when it's deployed, I think is not sensible. All right, I think that unfortunately it's time to wrap up. I would like to thank again, Leslie, for a great talk and a very engaging uh, conversation.
Um, next week, we're going to have uh, another uh, exciting uh, talk by Alison Okamura. I would also like to thank uh, the co-organizer, uh, Alberto, Luca, and Jeanette, and of course also the members of the student panel, James, Inoua, Rachel, and uh, Ansalu. As I said last time, uh, the seminar series is really an experiment in online robotics community building. So we really value your feedback. Please use the interface on the Robotics Today website to send us any comments you might have about format, suggested speakers, and so on and so forth. We read and discuss uh, each one of them. And finally, uh, we're going to post uh, the talk of Leslie on YouTube. Please allow us about a week or so for processing time. So the talk should be available in a week or so. With that, um, I'll close uh, this talk today and I look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you for inviting me and the great questions.